sing about the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God so loved the world that he sent his own son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to condemn it, but that the world may be saved through him. Blessed be thou, Lord our God, who has blessed us with thy laws and made bread to issue from the earth. From now on, this will no longer be the bread of the passage of our fathers from bondage to freedom. This Passover is for you today. The passage from the bondage of death to the freedom of life. This is the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread shall have eternal life. sacrament of the covenant God made with our fathers on Mount Sinai. This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant which is to be poured out for me.
now I give you a new commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for a friend. And if you love one another, all men shall know that you are my disciples. The hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. Keep in thy name those thou hast given. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. and the life. Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Let it be as you. This is your hour, Judas. The hour of shadows. Oh, master.
You betray your master with a kiss. That is the man. Arrest him. You traitor! No, 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 you betrayed him! What's going on? Peter, 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 listen to me. The only way the master can save himself is by speaking to the Sanhedrin. Take him away. Leave him alone! Let go! Leave him alone! Kill him! Oh. Jesus! Peter Andrew! Stop! Jesus! No, Peter! Get away, you scum! Arrest them all! Peter! It was me you sought. You have found me. Let them go. Take him away! Take him away! Take him away! Take him to the master! Peter, do something! Peter, do something! Lion! Change! Let's go! No, no, no! We can't do anything for him! We can't do anything for him! Brothers, let us save ourselves! Wait a minute. I know you. You were with that Jesus. You're one of his followers. No, no I don't know him. But he is. Look. And I know him. He is one of his followers. Yes, I've seen him. I've seen him. No. Catch him. He's a liar. No. Arrest him. No. I tell you, I don't know him. He was with him. I saw him. He's a friend of Jesus, a disciple. Don't let him go. Oh, please. Mistaken. I know. No, this Jesus they speak of, nor have I ever heard of him. Go. Just keep quiet here. Don't you know you're on uh, sacred ground? Behold the man. 
Well, what have you got to say for yourself now? Speak! You betrayed us! You betrayed us! You betrayed us! 
If you're what you say you are, if you're the Messiah, why don't you save yourself? Hmm? I'm not. Leave him alone. Don't you fear God, even when you are dying? We deserve to die. For we are receiving the just punishment for our crimes. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Today, you will be with me in paradise. His mother. Well, how can you prove it? Hey. She is his mother. Go, dear. And who are you? Please. I'm 
one of the family. Is that right? Yes. He is one of the family. The Romans won't let you get close. Others. Why can't he save himself now? Elijah. No, he's not calling Elijah. He's quoting the scriptures. Even now, nailed to the cross, he quotes the scriptures. Even now. He was despised and rejected of men, man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is done. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was abused for our iniquities. And through his wounds, we are healed.
Throughout the world, the term shroud refers to a linen cloth, 4 meters 42 centimeters in length, 1 meter 13 centimeters in width, that has been kept in Turin since 1578. On this light yellow ochre sheet, there are visible imprints that reproduce the frontal image left and dorsal image right of a human body. There also appear numerous other marks left by the vicissitudes suffered by the shroud during its life. The frontal image shows the face crowned by long hair and a thick beard, the thorax, the arms crossed over the pubic area and the legs stretched out. The posterior image shows the nape of the neck the back, the outstretched legs, and the soles of the feet. In particular, one notes two black lines running parallel to the longer side, burn marks caused by a fire that broke out in 1532 in the Saint Chapelle at Chambéry, then housing the shroud folded in a silver box.
The two black singed lines are due to contact with the overheated sides of the box. During the fire, a drop of molten metal fell onto the sheet, passing through every layer, destroying the fabric. This explains the symmetrical repetition of numerous triangular holes along the two black lines. In 1534, these holes were repaired by the Clare nuns of Chambéry, who covered them with patches. In addition to reinforce the area of the sheet damaged by the fire, the sisters sewed both the shroud and the patches to a sheet of linen called Holland cloth. For conservation reasons, these patches were removed in 2002 and the Holland cloth substituted by a new backing fabric, recognizable under the burns because of its different color and weft with respect to the shroud. In the central area of the sheet, there are a series of large rhomboidal marks with jagged edges. These were caused by the water that soaked the shroud at some time in its history. There are also four symmetrical groups of roundish burn marks, smaller than the former, which, without doubt, date from before the Chambéry fire. In this case, too, the new backing cloth appears beneath the holes, recognizable by its different color and weft. Along the upper edge, an eight centimeter wide strip of the same material as the shroud has been sewn on. Its extreme edges have two large gaps under which the new fabric can be seen. Along the lower edge of the left-hand gap, there is the area from which the two most recent material samples were taken for scientific purposes in 1973 and 1988. The shroud fabric consists of a valuable linen that appears to be hand-woven with a characteristic typical of herringbone cloth. The longitudinal strips, about one centimeter wide, are highly visible when the cloth is illuminated with close-up light. Upon enlargement, the herringbone weave is clearly visible. The face of the man of the shroud bears numerous bruised lesions that coroners have carefully studied. Swellings have been identified that appear coherent with hematoma. These are particularly visible on the right side of the face that is more swollen than the left. Furthermore, there are marks attributable to lacerated and contused wounds. the nasal septum is bent, caused by a fracture. All things considered, the man of the shroud appears to have been savagely beaten during the hours preceding his death. On the forehead, nape of the neck, and in the hair, 
one can observe numerous sinuous rivulets of blood originating from wounds caused by pointed objects with a small diameter. They radiate out from the head and appear to have been caused by a crown of sharp thorns placed on the head itself. The characteristics of the blood traces leaving the wounds allow the distinction between lesions involving arterial and venal vessels. Of particular interest is the blood stain in the center of the forehead, coming from a wound to a frontal vein that has the form of an upturned three, because it follows the lines of the forehead itself. On the right-hand side of the chest, there is a large blood stain originating from an oval wound caused by a pointed cutting object that struck between the fifth and sixth rib and penetrated deeply. The characteristics of this wound are important in that they show that it was inflicted after the death of the subject. The blood that spurted out of the wound is surrounded by a serous halo that is typical of blood flowing out of a corpse in which the serum and corpuscles have already separated. The frontal image of the shroud shows clear signs of the imprints left by the arms. These are stretched out with the hands crossed in the pubic region. On both forearms, there are long blood stains beginning at the wrist and flowing up to the elbow. Their direction appears unnatural as they seem to be flowing upwards. One must bear in mind that we are dealing with blood stains formed when the body was hanging on the cross and the wrists were higher than the elbows. The left wrist shows clear signs of a characteristic blood stain formed by two diverging trails of blood related to the two different positions assumed by the condemned on the cross, the prostrate and the erect. The blood flows out of an oval wound caused by a pointed instrument such as a nail. The location of this wound is of particular interest, not being on the palm of the hand as depicted in traditional iconographic representations of the crucifixion, but on the wrist. Of particular interest is the absence of thumbs on the image of the shroud, and this could have been caused by either the lesion of the median nerve or a tetanic contraction. The skin of the thorax and back have over a hundred excoriated round and linked bruises, about two centimeters in length, that are also visible on the lower limbs. These appear to be lesions caused by the flagrum, a Roman torture instrument, consisting of a wooden handle and thongs, at the end of which were attached two small dumbbell pieces of lead. It is difficult to establish the number of flagrum blows inflicted because we do not know the number of thongs on the flagrum. What we do know is that the torture was inflicted on a bent back with the body naked. At the height of the left scapular region and above the right shoulder, one can observe quadrangular bruises related to the marks left by a rough, heavy object that can be identified as the patibulum, the horizontal axis of the cross that the condemned sometimes carried to the place of execution. Finally, at the height of the kidneys, one observes a transversal blood flow that crosses the whole back. This is the blood spurting from the rib wound when the body, once removed from the cross, was laid in a horizontal position.
The lower limbs of the man of the shroud are easily discernible, both in the anterior and posterior images. Both knees show abrasion, very probably caused by falls, because in these areas, as on the soles of the feet, traces of soil have been identified. It is also worth noting that the left knee has been fixed by rigor mortis in a more bent position than the right one, and, as a result, the left leg appears shorter than the right one. The sole of the right foot is clearly imprinted, while the left one has only the posterior part near the heel visible. This suggests that the crucifixion took place using only one nail, and by placing the left foot on top of the right. On the sole of the latter, one notes the exit hole of the nail, from which depart the rivulets of blood descending towards the toes. The corporeal imprints that one sees on the shroud are dark in the relief areas, while light in the others. The image, therefore, has a light distribution opposite to that which we actually see. The imprint therefore appears to be the same as a photographic negative. By changing the image of the shroud into its photographic negative, light and shade are obviously inverted, and this, therefore, shows the true aspect of the man of the shroud, as we would observe were he in front of us. doors were barred and all the windows fastened down I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away and just before the sunrise I heard something at the wall the gate began to rattle, and the voice began to call. I hurried to the window, and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches, and the sound of soldiers' feet. And there was no one there but Mary, so I went down to let her in. And John stood there beside me, as she told us where she'd been She said they've moved him in the night And none of us knows where The stone's been rolled away And now his body isn't there We both ran toward the garden Then John ran on ahead We found the stone in the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said But the winding sheet they wrapped him in Was just an empty shell and how or where they'd taken him was more than I could tell well something strange had happened there but just what did not know John believed a miracle but I just turned to go circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high seen them crucify him then I saw him die back inside the house again the guilt and anguish came everything I had promised him just added to my shame when at last it came the choices I denied I knew his name even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. 
I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. He raised me to my feet, and as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. Every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace.